Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I'm going to start this morning by climbing right out on a limb and making a geopolitical comment, and it's this. Israel has, shall we say, a complex relationship with Egypt. Maybe you've noticed this. Certainly true today. On one hand, during the recent conflict in Gaza, Egypt's foreign ministry called for other nations to, quote, confront the aggressive Israeli practices against the brotherly Palestinian people. Fairly standard for that part of the world. On the other hand, for years now, Egypt has actually enthusiastically cooperated with the Israeli government in blockading the brotherly Palestinian people because Egypt does not feel particularly brotherly towards their Hamas organization. Complex. To give another example of this complex relationship, Egypt and Israel have fought not one, not two, not three, but actually four full-blown wars since 1948. Yet at the same time, Egypt was the first Arab state to recognize Israel as a state in 1979. Again, complex. And you know what? This complexity between these two nations, this is actually not a new thing. Egypt and Israel have had a complex relationship for, oh, 3,000 years, give or take. And you're probably aware of this. Genesis describes Egypt actually saving Israel during a famine through Joseph, and then giving them the best real estate, the land of Goshen, to settle in permanently. But afterwards, when there was a pharaoh who knew not Joseph, Genesis also describes Egypt enslaving Israel. And then Moses leading Israel's exodus from Egypt, pursued by Pharaoh's army. There's a complex relationship that goes back thousands of years. And you know, in Scripture in particular, Israel's complex relationship with Egypt, it's actually not just an exodus thing. I know that's what we mostly think of, but it's, it's bigger than that. If you look at a map, this makes sense. The land of Israel is right next door to Egypt and always has been. Not only that, but, but Egypt was not some quiet backwater that ancient Israelis in the time the Old Testament was written might visit on vacation to go see the pyramids. They were there then and people actually did go and see them. It was a superpower with, with big plans for its neighbors and lots of influence in the world. Egypt, Egypt was to Israel like, I don't know, maybe the United States is to Canada today. Actually, it's probably even more unbalanced than that. The vast majority of Canadians are not descendants of American slaves. So it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us when we come across passages about Egypt and the Bible after Exodus, like we do in Ezekiel chapter 31 this morning. Egypt was right there. It was so big and, and ancient and powerful. The people of Israel couldn't ignore Egypt even if they wanted to. So it shouldn't surprise us to come across Egypt and other places in Scripture beyond Exodus. But you know what might surprise us? It might surprise us when we recognize just how often in the Old Testament it's clear that, that Israel and Judah, they're not just next door to Egypt, this massive power that they have a complex and ambivalent relationship with. No, they're actually depending on Egypt to save their bacon. That's a weird way to say it, isn't it, when you think about it? For instance, for instance, King Hezekiah of Judah he looks to Egypt for salvation, salvation in a military form, when Assyria is besieging Jerusalem. 
We actually know this because the, the Assyrian general at the time, he, he actually mocks Hezekiah for this. And we hear it in Isaiah 36. He says, Behold, you're trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of anyone who leans on it. And we know Jeremiah, the prophet, he unsuccessfully warns refugees after the downfall of Jerusalem against running away to Egypt. Not only is he unsuccessful, but they actually force Jeremiah to come along with them. So Egypt, it's, it's this place that Israel actually looks to for, for aid regularly in the Old Testament. There's a lot of real politic in this, of course. The, the idea that the, the enemy of my enemy is what? My friend. That's just as much as part of the ancient world of the Bible as it is today. And it is true that, that Israel, it occupies this, this very valuable piece of the map, this connection point between, between Asia and Africa and Europe, if you're willing to walk far enough and swim the Bosphorus. And Israel and Judah, they don't just have Egypt to worry about. They, they have other powerful and aggressive neighbors like Assyria and Babylon and then Persia. I don't know why it is that they particularly looked to Egypt, but they did, to protect them from these other nations. But there's a deep irony to this, isn't there? Egypt, Egypt is the house of bondage. It's the place of slavery for Israel. It's where they ran away from. How can they truly look to it to be, to be their savior as it so often seems they do in the Old Testament. Even more importantly, you know that position of savior of Israel? It's taken, isn't it? It's a role that belongs to God alone, not to any earthly nation, no matter how powerful or conveniently located. And this is really what Ezekiel 31 is driving towards today. It's reminding us of these things. It's, see, the problem is not that Egypt isn't powerful. Far from it. Remember, remember where Ezekiel 31 begins. Verse 1, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom are you like in your greatness? And then notice in verse 3 the answer he gives. He, he says another great and powerful nation, Assyria, is exactly who Egypt is like. In Ezekiel 31, the image for both these great nations, Egypt and Assyria, it's the same thing. It's a mighty tree. Ezekiel 31 says a cedar in Lebanon, the place they thought of is where the best trees came from, with beautiful branches and, and forest shade and towering height. So Egypt really is that big and that powerful. And it's not even that Egypt isn't willing somehow to protect little nations like Israel or Judah if the deal's right. Great nations have always loved clients and vassals. And Ezekiel 31 captures this, saying, Under its branches all the beasts of the field gave birth to their young, and under its shadow lived all the great nations. It's as though Egypt in one sense, can deliver what Israel is seeking. The problem isn't, isn't that Egypt isn't strong enough. It isn't even that it isn't possible for other nations to shelter under its protection, so to speak. The problem is simply that insofar as God's people are depending on Egypt to save them, they're not depending on God. And insofar as Israel is depending on Egypt to save them. They're not depending on God. Now, I suspect you may be asking yourself, Peter, why are you preaching on this? There was other perfectly good scriptures you could have chosen. Ezekiel 31 can feel far away from us, right? We as Christians and as residents of America, well, we're not Old Testament Israel or Judah. And we aren't depending on some foreign nation to bail us out in whatever trouble we might have got ourselves into. Now this may be 
because we are fundamentally better than Israel and Judah at looking to God to be our savior instead of worldly powers. Or, and you had to guess there'd be an or, it may be because we live in a country that has at least as much in common with Old Testament Egypt as it does with Old Testament Israel and Judah. I mean, America's the mighty nation now, right? Geopolitically speaking, here I go again, we are the tree with the, with the beautiful branches and the forest shade and the towering height, its top among the clouds, to use Ezekiel 31's language. Now we're not unchallenged, and Egypt wasn't either, but at worst, we're pretty close to the top of the heap. For example, both current day Israel and current day Egypt look to shelter under America's branches. And our country happily cooperates trading development resources and military hardware and security guarantees for influence and power in their part of the world. So how do we apply Ezekiel 31 today? I mean, does it just mean that it would be better if present day Israel and Egypt trusted in God instead of the American F-16s we sell to both of them? Well, sure, all things being equal, that would be great. But I think that God in Ezekiel 31 has something a bit more direct to offer us. I think he offers us the same thing he had to say to Egypt. You see, Ezekiel 31 says to every nation, particularly every great nation, that power isn't permanent, that great nations aren't forever. Ezekiel 31 says there will come a day of reckoning, no matter how powerful any country seems at any given moment. Friends, that was certainly the case for Egypt, just like it was the case for Assyria before them. Look at verse 10 of Ezekiel 31. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it towered high and set its top among the clouds and, and its heart was proud of its height, I will give it into the hand of the mighty ones of the nations. He will surely deal with it as its wickedness deserves. And this is, in fact, what happened to Egypt shortly after Ezekiel received this prophecy. Egypt, Egypt was, the, was the most ancient and most stable nation the world had ever known. I mean, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around this, but Egypt had a pharaoh starting in 3150 BC and a linked history from that time forward. There's nothing like that anywhere else in the world, certainly not in that part of the world. But it was conquered. It was conquered by, by Persia in 525 BC. And you know, it didn't actually regain its full status as an independent nation until 1922. Egypt flourished, a great tree, so to speak, for more than 2,600 years. Makes us seem kind of young, doesn't it? And then it was ruled by outsiders for 2,500 years. There's a kind of symmetry to that. Friends, it's good to love the place we live. It's great to be proud of America and all that it has accomplished. But it is not forever. And believe it or not, America being the biggest tree in the forest. It's not actually central to God's plan of redemption. There's another tree for that. There is another savior for us. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me now to our gospel reading for today from Mark chapter four, starting at verse 30.
Hear this passage again. And Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants. You see, Jesus had actually read his Bible, and he knows about this image of kingdoms such as Egypt and Assyria as, as great trees towering over nations. There's even a direct connection between Jesus' words here in Mark and, and the passage we heard from Ezekiel 31. You may have caught it. Jesus says in verse 6, it puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. He's basically cribbing verse 6 of Ezekiel 31. Jesus is saying simply that, that when you or I are looking for a place to rest, for a kingdom to build our nests in, what we want isn't Egypt. It isn't even America. It is the kingdom of God. A kingdom that starts small, tiny even. Started in a manger in Bethlehem but grows up great. Friends, this is just one of the ways that following Jesus is so radical, so countercultural for us today. It takes people like us, living as citizens of, of countless earthly kingdoms and, and cultures and powers, And it invites us to at least spiritually pick up and move, so to speak, to another tree, to the kingdom of God. It tells us that no matter how mighty and permanent and great the kingdoms of the world are, no matter what health and safety and security they offer us, and these are wonderful things, they are at best only temporary structures like the earthly tent that Paul speaks about in our New Testament reading. But it's okay. Jesus' kingdom, the, the mustard seed kingdom, the kingdom that starts so small you can barely see it, it's a shelter that we can count on. It will outlast them all. It has outlasted so many already. So today, friends, where are you building your nest? Is it in an earthly kingdom? Well, there's nothing wrong and a lot right with being good citizens of the place we are. But here's the truth. Here is the truth straight from Ezekiel 31 and Mark 4 for us. The nations of the world, they may look grand, and they may look safe, and they may even look eternal, like Egypt did. But every great green tree falls in the end, except one. Amen.